The light that never dies. Imagine a light bulb that has been shining for 124 years. This isn't science fiction. In a small fire station in Livermore, California, hangs a bulb that was turned on back in 1901. Think about it. It has survived two world wars, the birth of the internet, and every generation of smartphones. While our modern gadgets break after a couple of years, this fragile glass grandmother with a carbon filament keeps glowing 24-7. It is officially the oldest working piece of technology in history. But why can't you buy anything like this today? Where did that level of quality go? when things were built to last. In the late 19th century, manufacturers prided themselves on making products that lasted decades. It was a matter of honor. Watches, furniture, clothing, all were built to outlive you and get passed down to your grandchildren. Quality wasn't a luxury, it was survival. Things were expensive. Imagine paying a whole month's salary for one pair of boots. Naturally, the cobbler had to make them last 10 years. People repaired everything instead of running to the store for a replacement. It was a golden age when buying an item meant buying it for life. The secret plot against us. Everything changed on Christmas 1924. In Geneva, the heads of Philips, Osram, General Electric, and others gathered in secret. They formed a cartel, the Phoebus Cartel, and agreed on something shocking, to make their light bulbs worse on purpose. Their goal was simple, reduce bulb lifespan from 2,500 hours to just 1,000. Any factory that produced bulbs that lasted too long was fined. This was the first time in history that business decided reliable products were bad for profit and we would pay for planned failure. Style over substance. While Europe sabotaged light bulbs, America invented a different trick. Ford cars lasted forever and sales began to drop. Everyone already had one. So GM executive Alfred Sloan introduced yearly model updates. The engine worked perfectly, but the outside looked outdated within a year. Neighbors would judge your old bumper. Thus, style obsolescence was born. Sloan discovered a psychological weapon. People would buy new cars, not because the old ones broke, but because they no longer looked cool. A law against old things. In 1932, during the Great Depression, real estate mogul Bernard London suggested a wild idea, create a legal expiration date for every product. Cars would get five years, clothes three, when time ran out, the government would seize and destroy your perfectly working item, forcing you to buy a new one. London believed using old things was a sin that harmed the economy by slowing production and job creation. The cartel died. The idea survived. World War II shattered the cartel. Its members ended up fighting on opposite sides. And in 1953, a U.S. court officially found Phoebus guilty. GE had to admit they deliberately weakened bulbs to control prices. Justice, right? Not quite. Companies paid symbolic fines and changed nothing. The artificial 1,000-hour standard invented by fraudsters became the global norm. The court case was won, but durable bulbs were lost forever. Stockings too strong. In 1940, nylon stockings hit the market. At first, they were almost indestructible. Women wore them for years without a single run. For business, this was a nightmare. If stockings don't rip, who buys new ones? DuPont gave engineers a shocking order, make the material worse. The formula was intentionally weakened, so stockings would tear faster. Lifespan dropped from years to months. Women spent far more money, and the company got rich on planned fragility. The art of breaking things. By the 1950s, teaching engineers to make products less reliable became standard in universities. 
It was called planned obsolescence design. Engineers created appliances that were impossible to open or repair. A throwaway culture emerged. Advertisements preached that tossing out a working fridge for a new one was doing your duty for the economy. Lifespan of electronics halved. Owning old items became embarrassing. The chip of death. In the 1990s, sabotage went digital. Printer manufacturers began putting microchips in cartridges. Do they improve quality? No. These chips simply count printed pages. When the limit is reached, the printer locks itself, even if half the ink is still inside. We're told it's device protection, but in reality, it's a trick to make you throw away a full cartridge and buy a new one. The battery scandal. In 2017, iPhone users noticed something strange. Their phones suddenly became painfully slow. The horrifying truth emerged. Apple was deliberately throttling old models via software updates. They claimed it was to protect old batteries, but forgot to tell customers. People assumed their phones were outdated and rushed to buy $900 replacements, all while the real fix was a $30 battery swap a choice Apple quietly removed. The right to repair. People got tired of being hostages. The rebellion started with farmers. Tractor maker John Deere banned them from repairing their own machines. Break down in the field? Pay the official service. In response, farmers began hacking their tractors. This sparked a global right to repair movement. New laws in the US and Europe now force companies to provide parts and manuals. We're finally remembering, if you bought a thing, you have the right to fix it. The war continues. Despite new regulations, manufacturers only got smarter. The death timer is now buried deep in software. Phones are glued shut, packed with proprietary screws and digital locks to prevent opening. We drown in mountains of waste, replacing electronics every three years. It costs us a fortune. Meanwhile, the Livermore light bulb still glows, silently proving that things can last forever. We're just not allowed to have them. Your choice. History repeats itself. Electronics that once lived 20 years now last barely three. We produce 50 million tons of e-waste annually while corporations invent new ways to drain our wallets. But that little bulb in Livermore is still shining, reminding us the world can be different. This is no longer just a fight for repairs. It's a fight for freedom. Who will win? Corporate greed or our right to truly own the things we buy? The choice is yours.